Uh-oh. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Sandy, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. And I have the lovely Ms. Bree Patterson, and she is what is your position with the Black Nurses Association? You're the... Well, I am a active member of the Health Policy Committee. That's awesome. And I am the founder of Nurses Against Violence Unite, which is a 501c3. And we're in over 11 countries as well as have reached over 30,000 people uh, every broadcast. Um, it's really exciting to be here and to be able to talk about such important things, um, especially that not only we need in nursing, but to help us move forward and to hopefully retain our, uh, our uh, you know, nursing staff, as well as also let's see, yeah, I'm just pulling this up on so I could see the comments. So I can our, uh, see you know, so we can retain not only nurses, but also other healthcare staff. Um, it's been really bad over the last couple of years, but violence in healthcare has always been a problem. And just because COVID came, it just like amplified everything. So, yep, and, so <laughs> and also, yep. And also, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I feel like that's the same, like it's the same type of deal. Like it's, it, the racism has just been amplified um, from the pandemic. Yes, and it's uncalled for. If anybody, we're gonna talk about the, the policy briefs that we have put together. And if you would like to have this sent to you or you can also get it on the Nurses March uh, Facebook group, we're going to be posting them in there as documents so you can share them with your legislator. Um, for all the reasons why policies have to change. And um, what we're going to do too is we're going to put the link in the chat um, to donate to the Nurses March. Let's see. Let me see if I can get the link. Do you have the link? Let's see if I can post the link. Let me get to this. No. So we are down to the wire for everything that we're doing with the March and every donation is vital to what we can bring to the platform as well as also what we can give out or, you know, the things that we have planned for that day. So between Bree and myself, we're going to, and we have the lovely Jessica Seitz, we have um, we have Janessa, we have Miss Juna, and also we have some great guests as well. And the executive director that's been putting all of this together is Marla Barthen. So we're super excited. We're going to put the link inside of the chat. Um, I don't know if we've done that yet. All right, I was able to find the link. So I put it in the comments. If you guys can take a look at it, that'd be awesome. So um, so tell me a little bit about your background, Ms. Bree. Um, so I've been a nurse, a registered nurse for nine years. I started off as a certified nurse assistant. Um, and then after I was working in a nursing home for a while, I wanted more acute care. So I got a patient care tech job um, at a local hospital and I applied to school at one of the community colleges. I got my associates. Um, my first year as a nurse, I worked overnights and obtained my bachelor's um, at another college in the area. Um, and then I went to the ICU for a little stint. Um, didn't necessarily work out for me there. Um, so I ended up traveling as a travel nurse. Um, I traveled in Baltimore, which I spent most of my um, travel um, career um, at a hospital there. And I also had a um, travel assignment in California, um, only for one assignment. It was too far from family. The weather was great, but yeah, it was just too far from family for me on the West Coast. Um, I would definitely want to go back and visit, but um, so I ended up going 
back to Baltimore, um, gaining residency there. And then I went to Coppin State University um, for a little bit um, in their um, FMP program. I had my son and then I ended up coming back home um, and was a travel nurse um, locally um, in my area. And post COVID, I'm a COVID, I suffer from COVID fatigue. So I work part-time now outpatient um, as a living donor advocate. Um, and I'm also a family nurse practitioner student um, at the University of Rochester. And I will be finishing up within the next year. That is so awesome. And you also are very active in which groups as far as advocacy? So, so um, for me, I am a officer of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee with the Department of Surgery at the University of Rochester. Um, like I said, I am a health policy member um, with the Rochester Black Nurses Association, and I also am a nominee um, this is new of the legislative director with the Genesee Valley um, Nurses Association. Um, so yeah, <laughs> those are my hats. That's so awesome. I'm yeah. so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> I, um, I just a little bit of my background. I have been a basically a, a bedside nurse all of my career. Um, I have had like maybe a maximum of a year away from the bedside, um, everything from med surge to telemetry and also psych, as well as also I did uh, correctional nursing up until January, I was waiting for my credentialing. And now I ha I'm building a successful practice as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. That's so exciting. <laughs> Good. We're coming out of the woodwork and I've gotten uh, a lot of reviews, which I'm very thankful for. And, and I contributed, my motivation was nurses against violence it, because there were so many nurses that were suffering from burnout, PTSD, and just needed somebody just to talk to that feels like, you know, they need to talk to somebody. And uh, Nurses Against Violence is something that stemmed from my doctoral project, which is preventing patient on nurse violence through education. And, um, and that's when I decided to go back for my psych nurse practitioner. I am also an educator. I love to educate about violence in healthcare and all kinds of violence in healthcare and how can we fix this problem. So we're going to talk about the first policy that I'm going to talk about, Ms. Bree, is that um, a, uh, the House of Representatives uh, 3165, the nurse Staffing Standards for Hospital Patient Safety and Quality Care Act of 2021. So this policy has some teeth and I absolutely think it's like phenomenal. So I wrote about this policy um, in my interpretation and all the reasons why, along with statistics and also uh, credible resources. So the issue is we can all agree that patients are sicker and from a patient standpoint, frequent statements ma it made is that there's not enough help and that patient observations of how hard nurses and nursing staff works. By 2020, the World Health Organization reported that the estimated 1 million nurses would be needed while the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that an additional 275,000 nurses would be needed from 2020 to 2030 due to the increased number of individuals reaching retirement age. Safety is key. It is a key factor in nursing and a standard that is never taken lightly when it comes to patient care. However, the contributing factors cannot be ignored when there is short staffing temporarily on or ongoing that could lead to near misses, even sentinel events. Nurses and nursing staff are faced with lopsided patient acuity assignments, incivility from management or peers, patient, patients that are upset, poor morale, feelings of defeat, and expectations to do skills out of one's own scope of practice or skill set ultimately resulting in poor patient outcomes, high turnover, poor CMS reimbursement surveys, injuries to staff and patients, increased call-offs, patient on nurse violent attacks, and higher workers' compensation claims. Gaps in this bill, 
for eight uh, for the House of Representatives Bill 3165 is an impressive bill and well thought out. It is, however, just the beginning as any of these bills that we're proposing. And when looking over this bill, a few things overlapped with the um, House of Representatives Bill 1195 and should be addressed with clarity for organizations to minimize loopholes and workarounds. So here are the gaps that I found. If a nurse supervisor, nurse manager, charge nurse should ever uh, should be proficient to work on their assigned units to assist staff if they are short. No refusing an assignment unless it is under the same provisions of a staff nurse on the same unit they work. If a nurse administrator, case manager, or other hospital administrator, <clears throat> excuse me, or supervisor should assist with the rotation to help with logistical uh, portion of the unit so they are seeing the gaps and assisting their team. To not penalize a travel or new nurse if they ask for direction on a task or procedure that they have not fluently completed. If there is a teaching moment, this would be this should be forgiven and does not put the nurse into a category of not being competent to work on the unit. Another one, the acuity staffing tool should be include mental health illness, uh, mental illness and addiction with uh, medical patients. So for medical patients and mental health patients, along with those that are addicted, all of that should be all in one acuity tool. Uh, cross train nurses on mental health units to give them the experience of helping medical patients that have or have had comorbid mental illness or addiction. So they would be able to spot when somebody might be having a crisis in mental health or having, if they're withdrawing from a substance. Also, um, clear rules and adherence to a no lunch break interruptions. In other words, if it's your break, it's your break. No phone, give up your phone, no interruptions. Semi-annually evaluate staffing plan versus the proposed annual. And these are the things that when you read the policy for 3165, it will be more clear, there will be more clarity. The proposed panel for the staffing plan should change every three to six months by a nurse voting system to prevent management bias. In other words, they were saying that, you know, the they would retain these uh, individuals for a longer period of time, but in reality, people talk and befriend others. So therefore it becomes lopsided with staffing. And that also puts the nurse that hasn't regularly worked on that unit gets usually the worst assignment. Proposing a safety advocate that is voted by nurses to serve annually and change every year. Safety advocate for nursing nurses assistance with the reporting staffing issues, educates the staff about policies and their right to report, assists staff with charting behavior that is clear if the patient should be flagged to prevent injury. The hotline to report inadequate staffing and patient care should be a third party. They are proposing for there to be a line, but usually there's always a loophole, right? So I identified the loophole as making this a third party entity, no connection to the corporate or facility staff. Third party team for trauma and counseling that is not connected to the facility like EAP, um, not to be a part of the corporate entity and to have no ties with employee records or employer review. Uh, safe staffing and healthcare facts. There's approximately 4.9 active registered nursing licenses and um, 996,154 active licensed practical vocational nurse licenses. According to the American Nurses Association, the hours per patient a day is the current model of how staffing is calculated. So be nurses to patients equals productive nursing hours divided by patient days times 24. It is convoluted, okay? The calculation does not address acuity for medical or a combination of mental health or addiction. Violence in healthcare has been directly linked to staffing shortages with emotional and physical abuse. For example, if there are 25 patients during the day on a medical surgical unit, one nurse may have five patients with 
all with high acuity where another nurse may have a lighter load. At night, the staff has three to four nurses and have between six to eight patients per nurse. Again, acuity is not, uh, the acuity is not a factor. So, and then I gave an example of the typical uh, assignment, which is a nurse has five patients. Two of those patients might be one opioid dependent, another one's you know, homeless that could be schizoaffective, no medications. Patient number three could have cellulitis of the, of the forearm because he fell in a thorn patch and may have had some, you know, heroin usage and that, and come to find out it was a needle stuck in their arm. Patient number four, status post one day left total knee, uh, hip replacement and patient number five to rule out MI patient stress test. So the priorities of nursing have changed dramatically. And we have historically not talked about the reality of what we're dealing with on the floors because of the curriculum out there. By adhering to safe staff, nurse, and patient ratios, it will not only reduce the length of time for the patient in the hospital, it reduces preventable events such as falls and infections, cuts down on near misses and sentinel events, increases patient satisfaction, higher job satisfaction, and retention of staff. Reduction of employee, uh, employee burnout, post-traumatic stress disorder, and call-offs. This was also referenced right from the American Nurses Association and a like article. So we are requesting support and these will be uh, offered in the Nurses March on Facebook. Um, these can be mailed out to your legislator or your Senator. So requesting support, staffing shortages impede on the safety and healing of our patient population, as well as forces the nurse to work outside of their knowledge set. <clears throat> Excuse me. Facilities are reporting nurses for refusing assignments that are dangerous and not and, and what was not presented to them prior to accepting the contract. During the surge of COVID, a group of medical surgical nurses were shown how to use med mechanical ventilation and forced to take on 13 patients a, a piece, each nurse, 13 patients. On a night shift, the staff refused to take the assignment and they were reported to the Board of Nursing for abandonment. Uh, nurses are leaving their positions or calling off their shifts due to exhaustion, burnout, and post-traumatic stress disorder. It is time to support nursing and their unwavering dedication towards patients and who will take ownership for their positions. The implementation of the Nurse Staffing Standards for Hospital Safety and Quality Care Act of 2021, which is the Bill 3165, nurses will be free to advocate, organize, and exercise their advocating for their patients without reprisal from corporate entities. We do not have a shortage of nurses. We have a plethora of healthcare corporations that are worried about their bottom line instead of patient and nurse safety. Due to the lack of support, nurses are leaving the bedside and nursing altogether in droves. We must act now to save nursing and pass this bill in the house. And so this is absolutely vital. And we're going to make sure that, you know, you, we're gonna make sure if you want these, this uh, policy brief to use for your reference, then it will be available in the Nurses March. And again, please go and we're still needing a little bit of extra funds for the Nurses March. So there's a link in the actual, uh, comments, please go to that and donate if you're able to. And Miss Bree, I would love to introduce you for your bill and policy brief. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the reason for me even getting involved with this march is because I am a Black woman. I'm a Black nurse, and I have definitely, be, definitely been a victim of racism um, while working. And that comes from patients to managers, you name it. Um, and in order for minority nurses, you know, to have our voices heard, there was a bill, the House of Representatives 666 Anti-Racism and Public Health Act of 2021 bill um, that I will be um, speaking on today. Um, and 
the theme is nurses advocating for health policy change. Um, so why to support this bill? Um, the, so the issues are, um, this bill outlines how racism and discrimination are still present today in America. Um, there is so much work to be done um, in order to have an anti-racist um, society. According to the American Nurses Association, 63%, um, and this is from um, a, a study that was um, conducted last year, I believe in October, um, that 63% of nurses are currently experiencing racism. Um, and race has been shown to result in, in, in inequality in nursing practice and nursing education, because that's where it starts. That's how you know, people learn how to practice as a nurse. Um, nursing professionals often discuss cultural competence with little to no um, acknowledgement of race, power, oppression, privilege, racist policies, and and um, institutional racism. Um, there has also been societal silence around racism, um, which assists in maintaining systemic racism and encourages the unintended outcomes that influence the nursing profession, including those in leadership and academia positions. Um, the Nurses March supports um, efforts to reduce racism in the nursing profession. So background. So as I mentioned before, the American um, Nurses Association had conducted, conducted a survey um, last year and I'll be reading some of the statistics um, from, from this study. So 50% of nurses says that there, are, there is a lot of racism in nursing. 56% say racism in the workplace has negative, negatively impacted their professional well-being. Uh, 57 percent have challenged racism in the workplace. Um, 64 who have challenged racism in the workplace said that their efforts resulted in no change at all. 75 percent of nurses have witnessed racism in the workplace. 92 percent of Black nurses have personally experienced racism in the workplace. And over three-fourths of or 75 percent of black nurses say racism negatively impacted their professional well-being. 70 percent of black nurses experienced racism from leadership. 68 percent was from patients. 55 percent from colleagues. 73 percent of Asian nurses have personally experienced racism in the workplace. 69 percent of Hispanic nurses have personally experienced racism in the workplace and 28% of white nurses have personally experienced racism in the workplace. So by eliminating racism in nursing, it would create a more conducive and inclusive culture for growth leadership, managerial and board positions. Nursing uh, profession would have be better representation in the growing unrepresented minority groups. It will reflect the increased need for representation in the nursing profession, considering that Nursing today is still 80% white. Um, it will provide health um, care for unrepresented populations. It will promote equitable and inclusive workplace and academic environment. So suggestions for the legislators. So we are asking that they provide funding to perform quantitative studies about experiences of underrepresented groups of nursing to support legislation that would require culturally competent curriculum and course content that promotes an anti-racist nursing profession, provide funding to organizations to set up plans with buy-in from leadership, because that's where it starts, staff and employees with built-in accountability for outcomes. And accountability is, is a big one also, because you can have a plan, but without a plan and without being accountable for your actions, it's null and void. Um, and also provide funding to schools and university with buy-in from leaderships, faculty, and students, and with also with that built-in accountability for outcomes as well. So as far as our attendees that's gonna be coming to the March, um, my suggestions to you um, is first, you can have a copy of, of this policy brief and send it to um, your local representatives um, and have all of your friends and family be in support of this as well, because this is a big problem. Um, racism is a public health problem. Um, so yes, yeah, so that would be one suggestion. Um, also a pledge of all healthcare providers to be held accountable, be transparent and reflect on all things regarding racism in nursing. Also to set up organizations, um, organizational plans with buy-in from the leadership staff and employees. 
um, and to set up um, academia plans buy-in from leadership faculty and students, develop strategic outcomes with built-in accountability for diversity, equity, and inclusion incentives in healthcare organizations, um, and develop strategic outcomes with built-in accountability for DEI incentives in nursing schools and universities. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> we got a whole lot to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could go on, but to be short and brief, and this is, you know, hit all those major points. Um, I think that getting involved with us and advocating for us is the biggest push here. And it's not just about me and Dr. Rizaldi here. It's about all of us as nurses. It's about us making a change um, for the nursing profession. My saying is be the change you want to see in nursing. And that is why I am here today. I can definitely vouch for myself on that. Um, please, um, please, please, please support us. Um, we do have the GoFundMe link in the um, chat. Yep. So um, donate, share, post, all that. Really appreciate all of your support. And it, this is for all nurses. Yes, it is. And, you know, we have come a long way in in our own practice you know both yourself and 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 myself and there's a lot of nurses out there that have lost their voice because our voice has been taken away from us and now it's time for us to encourage the advocating because that's Absolutely. what we do you know Absolutely. that is like like i can't wait for may 12th like i just can't whether it be good, whether it, you know, like I just am looking forward to it because finally, doesn't matter who you like or whatever, we're all coming together to say what well, we need to say and make a statement. That exactly. is the most important thing that we could possibly ever do for our profession. Exactly. You know, we don't have a shortage of nurses, we don't have a shortage of healthcare workers. People are just tired. I had a nurse waiting, you know, that took care of me at when I was picking up a lunch for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a medical assistant. And then there, there was another, there was a nurse and there's nurses that are going to get jobs at Home Depot. There's, I mean, it is really like nurses are leaving. And if we don't- if As we, a workplace is toxic. Yeah, it's toxic. And by not supporting each other, exactly, you know, we are welcoming everybody, everybody to our march. If you see another nurse, high five them when we're down in DC. Doesn't matter who you, you're supporting. The fact of the matter is, we're taking over DC, right? It's going to be a lot of fun. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about my most favorite bill because it ties in, do you, what do you think? Do you think it ties in every, every other bill, the, the two bills that we just introduced? Yeah, I mean, I think all of them pretty, like we need all of them. <laughs> yeah, we need all of them. And all each them. one, Yeah. and overall, right? And you can agree or you can disagree. It, it's okay. I know. Everybody has the right to what they, <laughs> like violence, is translated into different things, right? So we have we have the anti you know, we have racism in healthcare, we have patients treating nurses, whichever, you know, either, you know, black, white, Asian, um, Hispanic, you know, one of my friends, she's Hispanic and she's had some nasty things said to her, but you know what she does? Oh, no, 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 no. But we've become in the in the way that we've been told about the surveys and patient satisfaction and all of this hoopla, right? When it comes down to it, we have to say enough's enough. Absolutely. You, can, you cannot talk to me, Mr. Smith. You cannot talk to me that way. Well, sure I can. No, sir, you cannot. <laughs> you have to put up your boundaries. Boundaries. This is my happiness. Never let somebody else's storm change the direction of your sale. That is absolutely. something that I believe absolutely in. So I'm going to talk to you about 
And I hope, I really would love to meet Representative Courtney. Like that is like, I have been talking to him, you know, his office on and off since my very first March in 2019. And it is the 1195 Workplace Violence Prevention for Healthcare and Social Service Workers Act. So there are some things that I promoted also on the doctors that I talked about with this bill. And I put them also into here where you have, when you really think about it, staffing is only the tip of the iceberg. When it's this, when you see that there's poor staffing and there's poor morale, people are leaving. Why? We have to remember our why. Why are things happening? We have to look and see the whole picture, not just one result of. Mm -hmm. So this was something that was the root of my doctoral project with the um, the preventing patient on nurse violence through education, because it starts in education. It starts in how we treat each other. So even from the very beginning and historically women have never been kind to each other. So this is the, this is moving forward, the movement of not only kindness, but there's also a movement of saying enough is enough. So the issue here, healthcare and social support workers are entitled to have a violence-free work environment. Healthcare staff at the bedside pre and post COVID have endured immeasurable violence with some captured, with some captured but not all due to the fear of reprisal from administration or peers of reporting the incident, employer failure to take action to prevent the attack and lack of follow through on average. My research has, has counted a minimum of 13 continuing assaults on the victim reporting a physical attack from a patient noted as type two violence situation that takes place in a covered facility, which means that's a hospital, that's a healthcare agency, that is a facility, you know, whatever that is a type two violent occurrence. The common statement of violence is a part of the job has ingrained into the mindset of nurses and healthcare professionals. As select facilities focus on de-escalation techniques, the definition points to de-escalation an already uh, of an already violent event or patient when prevention the preventing the violence to begin with is the key. It's also very cost effective for injuries and also, um, you know, like other things that I'm going to talk about. So preventing physical attacks involves training that adheres to societal trends, security, environment, and relationships. And this is a part of the project. Um, the current environment in healthcare facilities is toxic. There's your word. Um, it is. It is. A <laughs> survey-driven CMS HCAPS has given corporate entities the mindset of patient satisfaction where the survey is flawed, where the patient sees a person wearing scrubs, they automatically think it is a nurse or a doctor in a white coat. We have a healthcare staff, we have healthcare staff that is not adequately trained combined with a society that's suffering massive amounts of mental illness and addiction. Nursing and medical licensure and certificate programs lack guidance from the state boards to look at the health trends in society and modify to increase mental health and addiction training along with tools, tools to prevent violence and build a mentally healthy workforce. Outlined in this bill, it is the requirement for the employee victim to receive prompt medical and trauma support, mental and mental health treatment from the facility along with a solid violence prevention program. This is something that Nurses Against Violence already has. It's trademarked and it's ready to be implemented in work environments. As, the, as with the introduction, so here are the gaps. As with the introduction of any new bill, there, are, um, there will be areas not realized where, uh, and where we can fill in these gaps and support for future amendments reflecting such changes. The one thing that we have to understand, this is all just the beginning. So this bill itself, the 1195, 
is at the Senate and they're gonna be voting on it roughly around the time that we're going to be at this March. So anything that's been implement implemented and has already passed the House cannot be amended. So this is the beginning and it's a beautiful bill. And with these other two combined, it is absolutely what we need. So here are some more gaps, right? <clears throat> And you'll hear a little bit of what I'm saying also goes with both HR 666, which is the anti-racism bill, and also the staffing ratios bill, which is 3165. Employee assistance programs should furthermore be a third party entity that never intersects with the facility or has shared access to employee records. Penalties for facilities that lose more than 10% Hold on a second. I, did you hear what I just said? Penalties for facilities that lose more than 10% of their bedside workforce with a corrective plan of action and education for the administrative staff with a rebound of retention and job satisfaction surveys. Courses include, but not limited to, relationship building, conflict resolution, mission and policy adherence to their own policies. That means, you know, absolutely supporting the policies with workplace violence and also any laws that are for assault and battery, period. Signage throughout the facilities about not tolerating violence and adhering to 100% to policy for uh, safety. Anonymous reporting on the unit for those affected and afraid of reprisal. This will build not only trust with staff, but by seeing the facility and administrative changes. Shortened reporting systems to give the victim the opportunity to report the physical assault to the police while at work with full authorization from the facility with paid time off. When injured at work, to not penalize the worker by using their saved time off for their injuries that happened on the clock. In other words, PTO. That should be yours. Shorten the worker's compensation time for payment and or have the facility fill the gap sooner so that the employee can pay their bills and not be forced to return to work sooner. Injured, still. Cameras in the hallways and all rooms for flagged violent patients. They should be standard. Violence and healthcare facts. The American Nurses Association in 2018 conducted an anonymous survey, which 62% of the 14,000 nurses comes out to 8680, 8,680 workers stated that they had suffered verbal and physical abuse from patients. That is also, um, another article also translated this into one in four nurses are physically assaulted by a patient. Underreporting violent incidences is an epidemic. In the healthcare industry alone, fear of reprisal, administration failure to act to fix the issues of violent attacks, micromanaging, and peer aggression impact reporting incidences. Medscape conducted a recent survey of 10,778 nurses of all specialties and levels, the average of, uh, which is the average of nurses, uh, RNs, LPNs, and nurse practitioners stated abuse. For administration, 50% was emotional abuse, 77 verbal abuse from administration. Peers, 42% emotional abuse, 43% verbal abuse. From patients, 39% emotional abuse, 25 verbal, and 82 on average of violence towards them. Underreporting for uh, physical abuse, underreporting incidences, 82% across the board for RN, LPN, and, and, and nurse practitioner. So we're requesting your support. If you know or love somebody in nursing, medical, or working in social services, please know that the culture described can transform a person and not necessarily in a positive way. The person that you once knew is happy and full of life, maybe drinking a little bit more, pain medication to help with ongoing back pain, smiling on the outside and dying slowly on the inside. 
most of all, not saying a word to their family or their friends or coworkers, because we know where that goes. A recent study reveals that female and male nurses are at higher risk for suicide. For example, national female suicide rate is seven per 100,000. As for male nurses, 27 per 100,000 committed suicide from 2005 to 2016. The violence in healthcare is destroying those that help heal the public. Post-COVID nurses, uh, post-COVID, most uh, many nurses know or have heard of a nurse committing suicide. And the numbers have not been posted, but we can anticipating them being at an epidemic level. By the end of 2022, it is estimated that over 50,000 nurses alone will be leaving the bedside due to burnout and PTSD and lack of support and also warlike COVID trauma. The need for HR 1195, the Workplace Violence Bill, to pass the Senate and be signed by the president is dire. We need your voice to lift this bill throughout the Senate and into fruition so healthcare professionals can start the healing process. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a crisis and it is us that has to help heal these problems. By the time legislation is passed, we are gonna lose not only more nurses at the bedside and nursing assistants, as well as also respiratory therapists and also even EMTs that are picking up our patients. We're gonna lose individuals going to work at Home Depot or even suicide. We have a dire problem and we have to stand up collectively to say enough is enough. It is so important that we take these policy briefs and even if you just leave it the way it is and put a cover letter, Mr. or Mrs. or Representative so-and-so, please read this policy brief and why it's so important or Absolutely. brief, why it's so important that we need these to pass the Senate. We are a powerful profession. Everybody knows at least a hundred other people. Imagine what it's like for nurses. So I want you to take that and I want you to run with it. If you need these, I'll also post them also in Nurses Against Violence. So we're gonna post the link one more time. And of course, mine's not working. <laughs> All right, so Ms. Patterson, do you have anything you would like to say? Well, yes, I do. I like to thank you for having me on this evening to get these very important topics out and to let everyone know what we're advocating for when we do go to DC on well, May. Well, yes, I do. I like to thank you for having me on this evening to get these very important this topics thing. out and <laughs> to let everyone know. <laughs> okay, so you always get, we'll have a snafu with technology. All right. I was like, wait. Right. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> so people may not necessarily know what a policy brief is or they do. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, let people know that this is a formal way of getting in contact with your um, local or um, state representatives um, to get bills um pass first it has to go through the house of representatives and then the um, u.s house of senate and then it gets signed or vetoed you know signed by the president or vetoed um and it becomes a law so there is a process with this but in order for us to see a change we have to be active we have to get involved and the biggest thing is we have to work together um and this is for all nurses, um, we definitely need to have a change and we are the change and we need your help um, in supporting us um, and donating, volunteering, sending up, sending, sending your um, policy brief, calling your House of Representatives, do what you have to do to advocate for not only you, but your colleagues, your families, um, your friends, everybody knows a nurse, everybody's connected with a nurse. So yeah, this is our time. Even if it's $5, guys, please donate. 
we need them, you know, we need to make sure that we have the funds to make sure that we can provide for everybody, right? We wanted this to be the most memorable moment ever for the rest of our lives. This is going to be a memorial for those that were lost um, during COVID for all the nurses and healthcare workers that were lost. So it's absolutely imperative. And they're also working on getting it noted as um, the, the Ms. Marla and our group that we're working very hard to get it noticed as the National Caregiver uh, Day, National Caregivers Day on for declared for May 12th. So we're super excited and we look forward, we are looking forward to the March. We so we're also celebrating what 202 years of nursing. Yes, 202. <laughs> so <Yeah>. that two <laughs> is COVID. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so it's just crazy. So anyway, I want to I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Miss Patterson for joining me. Thanks for having this, me. This has been a, a wonderful time, and I really appreciate you coming on with me. Um, no, you I, are a gem. You really thank are. You. So are you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so sweet. So everybody, have a great night, and we'll see you at the march. Thank you. Thank you.